Good afternoon and welcome once again to Digital Look TV. Joining us today we have Alistair McKay. He's Senior Market Analyst at IG. Alistair, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's talk about the results of the UK elections, particularly, particularly Brexit. How much of a risk is that? Well, it certainly is a risk because um, the uh, government have stated that they are going to hold a referendum mm -hmm. as to whether the UK should stay within the EU prior to 2017. So there is that hanging over the, uh, the uh, economy at the moment. That being said, I think it's broadly accepted that uh, including that as part of their manifest manifesto for the election really was a vote-winning strategy rather than a policy with which the Conservatives would like to see come to some sort of fruition. And I think we've got to hope as well that there's maybe been lessons learned on the back of the Scottish referendum in so much as educating the populace as to the benefits that the EU give to the UK rather than just the generalised perception that uh, the EU is in fact a a busybody interfering uh, operation that uh, gets in the way with what the UK wants to get on with. Okay, let's run through some scenarios. Let's say Brexit does occur. What would be the impact, do you think, on the UK economy? Insofar as it is possible to predict the impact on the UK economy, the impact on UK stocks? Uh, pretty bad, um, in short. Uh, okay. I think the, uh, the fact of the matter is that the UK economy, the service sector in the UK economy, has been very important over the last decade. Um, and a, just a glance at the City of London highlights uh, the volume of international banks which use London as a gateway, mm. quite frankly, into the Eurozone. Maybe not the full embodiment into the Eurozone, but a, a very comfortable halfway house. And remaining part of the EU would, maintains that status. If we were to um, remove ourselves from that, I think the attraction of London would be diminished greatly, certainly for the likes of, say, US institutions. And I don't think that's something that the government uh, would be willing to uh, countenance. I think they would battle that uh, equation quite aggressively. Okay. Another critical question for the UK, Scotland. They also want a referendum at some point. Will they get it? What would be the implications for Scotland, for the UK? Well, interestingly enough, in the, the latest um, general elections we had, 95% of the seats available in Scotland went to the Scottish National Party. Mm -hmm. And that highlights pretty aggressively how much uh, nationalism there is north of the border. Um, I think um, from a personal point of view as a Scot living outside Scotland, I think the consequences of Scotland gaining independence in the short term would be pretty bad. I think it could lead to a decade-long recession. Uh, I think the, the population would, uh, those that would be able to on a business or community sense, would emigrate. The financial business that we see in the likes of Edinburgh would arguably relocate south of the border as well. I think there would be a lot of bad consequences. That being said, you can't help but feel Scotland as a nation has maybe been sitting on its laurels for the last hundred years. Mm. If you look at the, the longer term history of Scotland, it's had a, a disproportionate amount of thinkers, doers, mathematicians, uh, politicians, uh, inventors, creators, and arguably the last hundred years we haven't really been at our A game. Maybe uh, a devolution between the two nations would be the, the aggressive kick up the backside that Scotland would need uh, to, to get its game together. But I think there would be very, very tough times ahead of that. I don't think that's something we're going to see being offered to Scotland in the short term. Mm -hmm. I don't think before, say, five to ten years, there might be another referendum. Okay. And for the UK, for the rest of the UK, if Scotland were to decide to leave, even from the point of view geopolitically, a diminished UK, one of the key actors on the world stage, even though some people say it, it is no longer such, that has a profound impact. Um, also, the example says for other countries. But <clears throat> again, from the point of view of the UK, geopolitically, less influence on the world stage surely cannot be positive for the UK, for Britain. And then economically also, for the rest of Britain, what would be the implications of, the, of Scotland leaving? And also, naturally, for sterling assets. Sure. Well, I think when we look at Scotland, we've got to look at population density. And quite frankly, it's a, a less um, populated landmass which basically means that uh, per square mile it's more expensive uh, to, to cover the cost of infrastructure, of right. sewage, of roads, of maintenance, you know, the costs that are associated. From that point of view, it would be quite a cost-saving um, aspect for England to segregate themselves from Scotland. I think as well, if we look at the revenue from the North Sea, it's uh, on an annualised basis. It's not a, a, a steady flow uh, of income that gets derived from it. Mm -hmm. And I think as time ticks on as well, it's fundamentally could become going to become less and less of a benefit. Um, so from that point of view, arguably, uh, greater positives for, for England. 
uh, to separate themselves. But uh, you're right in regards to the broader sense, in regards to the United Kingdom's standing in the global arena. Uh, you've got to remember that Scotland have maybe contributed disproportionately politicians um, south of the border in, in Westminster um, and leaders and thinkers. Um, and I think they help create a, a more rounded view of the UK, possibly sometimes helping the English um, just um, gain more acceptance on the, the, the global arena, I think it might be fair to say. Um, okay. So from that point of view, I think it would be a disadvantage. Also, if you look at the military as well, uh, Scotland's contributed more than its fair share of, um, of leaders and quite frankly of foot soldiers as well. And there's a lot of military bases north of the border as well. There'll be uh, extensive implications uh, for that too. All right. Okay, on the subject of all things Scottish, Royal Bank of Scotland, a buy? Well, it's a tough one, that. Um, I, I used to work for the Royal Bank of Scotland many moons ago, um, and I think they're far from reaching the, the end of all the, the changes, infrastructure changes, that are going to be required. That being said, the government have highlighted in just last week in the Mansion House speeches their eagerness with which to extract themselves from, quite frankly, being a bank holding Lloyd's, holding the Royal Bank of Scotland, also holding Royal Mail as well. And I think they'd be keen to, to, to move away from that. Uh, one of the questions that has been asked in the, in the press and, and more broadly in the city is, would we be willing, accepting of the fact that we'd be crystallizing what would be, what, seven, seven and a half billion pounds worth of a loss if we were to uh, extract ourselves from the Royal Bank of Scotland? I guess the question here is, maybe not so much are we willing to accept the loss, is why did we bail out the Royal Bank of Scotland in the first place? Was it to make a profit or was it in fact to stop the Royal Bank of Scotland going to the wall and the bankruptcy and the run on banks that subsequently would have come? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'd say it's the latter. So we're not looking to make a profit from it. I still think that a few tweaks, maybe a bit more time, uh, more resilience in the, the markets might enable us to meet halfway between the two, we'd diminish the loss a little bit more, okay. give the Royal Bank of Scotland more of a stable footing as well before mm -hmm. letting them go off on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay. Back on the subject of referendums. The Greeks, they also want to say, we're heading into a critical two weeks of negotiations between Athens and Brussels, its international creditors. What do you think will happen? What would happen should Greece leave the Eurozone? Yeah, well, I think Greece leaving the Eurozone is, is not something that the general populace want, either in Greece or in the Eurozone. As far as Greece is concerned, I think there is an acceptance and understanding that should they leave, it's effectively jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. Um, there would longer term be benefits, but in the short term, cost of borrowing would skyrocket. Um, austerity measures would happen more instantaneously, more aggressively as well. Um, and I think it would be quite a crushing blow to their global standing. As far as the Eurozone is concerned, certainly the founding members, they never had a plan in place for countries to leave. No, indeed. So, the idea that a country would leave and that the plan of a unified union being able to more uh, successfully take on the likes of the United States and the more global uh, economic zones, the fact that that could not work is arguably something they wouldn't really want to countenance. So I still think there's going to be as much wriggle room on both sides as they can possibly manage. Ultimately, what I think is going to have to transpire here is that Syriza are going to have to have a referendum inside Greece and saying, do we want to remain part of the Eurozone? Okay. Should the Greeks then vote and say, yes, we do want to remain part of the Eurozone, then Syriza would be given a mandate which would say, okay, do what you have to do to stay as part of the Eurozone. And then they would be able to break their pre-election mandate, which was to be anti-austerity. That, I think, is the situation we find ourselves in. The, the three-page revision that they put in front of the ECB just last week was never going to be enough to, to appease those looking for greater austerity change. Um, and I think they need, great, they need much more to be brought to the table. And I think the only way they can do that is arguably through that measure. So eventually the Greek situation, it will resolve itself. That's my take on it at the moment, but we're in a run-up to it. The time, the, the time is ticking away here. Uh, and as much as the IMF are able to shift their payment to the end of the month, mm. some of the more corporate and banking debt that the Greeks owe don't have that flexibility. And you do fear for some defaults materializing in that. Sarizo have been pretty aggressive in their phraseology about how they would rather pay off pensions than pay off debt. And okay. I think that's, uh, 
that would be uh, maybe a step too far, arguably. Do you, so would you recommend for a, an investor in the UK, should they basically essentially look through this volatility in the short term? Well, we're going to have volatility. We're, we're less than a month away from a summer budget. Um, and when you consider that the uh, Chancellor, George Osborne, stated in his Mansion House speeches just last week that he was looking uh, for the UK government to effectively have a mandate under normal uh, economic circumstances to run a surplus. And now that's an admirable target, yeah. but one that has been seldom reached in the last hundred plus years Indeed. in the UK. Yeah. So that would infer that we've got austerity measures are about to come our way. Mm. The city, I think, has broadly been positive with the Conservatives uh, having a majority. It means there's no coalition. It means that they, we've got a government in place who are able, more able, to bring policies they want to the table, mm -hmm. uh, to act more decisively, more speedily. And I think this, the business community like that. Um, I do think we've got further issues to, to worry about. And we've got to remember that the Eurozone is our largest trade partner. They're right on our doorsteps. And I think that weighs on the UK economy, arguably, more than anything else, is what's going on in Europe, rather than necessarily the state of our recovery. I think we've kind of reached a stage where we're on cruise control, waiting for that picture to become a little bit clearer. Okay, so then given this backdrop, globally, as far as the UK is concerned, as far as Scotland is concerned, stocks or bonds? I'm still going stocks. Our stocks are still the, the primary home for, for funds. Which ones? Well, um, the reason I'm saying that, uh, just to, to, to mm -hmm. go back, is at the moment we've got penciled in September 2016 as the end of European ECB quantitative easing. Okay. When we consider, when we look back at the US, it took three bites of the cherry to get it right over there. Mm -hmm. I'd love to think that the ECB president Mario Draghi and his team are going to get it right first time, but in reality, I think we're going to see that timeline extended, which basically means we're going to see a continuation of 60 billion euros on a monthly basis on the, the debt markets. Okay. Now, at the beginning of that, we had 10 billion of that was instantaneously going to the secondary market, mm. i.e. banks were selling off their debt to the ECB okay. in order to the ECB to meet those targets. Mm. Due to the way that yields have changed, I think it's more likely than not that that 10 billion euro level is probably a little bit closer to 15 billion euros, so even more benefits being pushed towards equities, helping create a, a safety net between the, but underneath the equity markets. So I think equities really are still remain the primary home. As far as the equity market in the UK is concerned, well, the FTSE 100 doesn't really have too much to do with the UK economy. It's a global index. 75% of the revenues that's derived from companies there are actually more affiliated to the US dollar than they are to sterling. Right. If we take a step back and look at, say, the 250, there are a few sectors we, we need to be a little bit cautious of. Uh, infrastructure, um, that's arguably going to be where some of the mm. austerity measures might come in. That's really Transportation, right. travel as well, mm -hmm. likes of, say, stagecoach, rail companies. Defensive stocks as well, we'd be a little bit cautious of. You've got to imagine they might feel the pinch as well, mm -hmm. likes of BAE Systems, for instance. Right. Um, that being said, I think there are still a number of sectors that look quite attractive. The pharmaceutical sector, I think US pharmaceuticals still need to replenish the lack of uh, pipeline of goods that they had. We liked, we've we seen the likes of Pfizer, for instance, their stockpile of uh, uh, exclusivity uh, products that they had have diminished. Some exclusivity is already finished mm -hmm. and they've got a number of uh, deadline dates that are looming. Like so many companies, they decided to curtail their research and development six or seven years ago in order to batten down the hatches and ride out the tough times. Which they have. But they haven't managed to replenish it. The only way to replenish it at such short notice is going to be M&A activity. So maybe we still look at AstraZeneca, <clears throat> maybe we still look at Shire, maybe we still look at other some of the other European and UK pharmaceutical sector companies. But another area I think is, is ripe for further uh, mergers and acquisitions is going to be the telecommunication sector. More Please. broadly, I think we're looking at the sort of four tiers of that. We're talking about telecommunications, we're talking about broadband, mm -hmm. we're talking about mobile devices, and we're also talking about content. Because let's face it, people these days don't necessarily view their television watching is on pads, on smartphones, on Androids, not just necessarily TV stations. And I think the, the, the functionality between all of those different arenas is much more broad. And we see a number of companies that are pretty cash rich looking to utilize it, the likes of Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom at the moment, looking to strip off some of their US exposure. Mm -hmm. And that looks like that's going to come to fruition. That'll put them in a position to maybe 
look at some other fur further acquisitions. They've been touted as potentially looking at BT. Okay. And I think there's more in that Quite a area. Bit of M &A. I think we'll end up having maybe two or three major European companies that straddle a number of those arenas rather than the, the multitude of smaller firms we see at the moment. Okay. Alistair McCake, Senior Market Analyst, IG, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Please do join us soon. Will do.